May the 10th, Jalalabad. Under shell fire, a Mujahideen ambulance heads up to the front line. The driver's a volunteer and a brave man, but bravery doesn't make up for the lack of organized medical care. Here, if you're wounded seriously, you're as good as dead. The wounded man was hit in the head by a bullet ten hours ago. He's beyond help. As more shells land nearby, a war that's claimed more than a million lives in ten years has just claimed another one. This is the story of how a holy war has come to nothing, how it's degenerated into aimless destruction. Back in February, the courage and persistence of the Afghan rebels had driven out the Soviet invaders, but the price was terrible. The countryside was deserted. Most people were either dead or in refugee camps abroad. The Russians had devastated it. The regime they'd left behind them was collapsing. Its soldiers were surrendering everywhere. The Afghan rebels, the Mujahideen, had suffered heavily. But when we began filming in February, the picture seemed clear. It would be a race between the various Mujahideen groups to capture Kabul. With its Soviet defenders gone, the city lay helpless and vulnerable. No one expected it to hold out long. After ten years of fighting, the prize was within reach at last. The government there was threatened from every direction. In the north, the most famous Mujahideen leader, Ahmed Shah Massoud, was in a position to swoop down, cutting Kabul's lifeline from the Soviet Union. The eastern approaches were menaced by Mujahideen forces already massing round the country's third biggest city, Jalalabad. In the south, the former royal capital, Kandahar, straddling a traditional invasion route, was under siege. In the mountains to the west, the Shia Muslims, led by Sheikh Anwari, were making daily inroads into Kabul itself. In the making of this program, Panorama was to visit each of these areas in turn. On February the 10th, as the Russians were leaving, seven Mujahideen groups amid scenes of characteristic disorder gathered in Pakistan to form an interim government. The leaders hadn't personally fought in the war or even spent much time lately in Afghanistan. Some were tough infighters, some were non-entities. They were united only by hatred for what they called the Soviet puppets. We are not going to talk with the regime in Kabul. Until the puppet regime is not gone, we, we have to continue with the struggle. Because this puppet regime has not the, the support of one person, the Afghanistan people. The dominant figure in the interim government was a religious hardliner, Gulbadin Hekmatyar. He was subtle and unforgiving, and anyone who crossed him was liable to be branded a traitor or a heretic. Pakistan had backed him strongly for its own political purposes. And despite his fundamentalism and deep hostility to the West, the Americans backed him too, as the friend of their friends. But neither country had much control over him. No one has the right to interfere in our internal affairs or to impose his solution, wishes, willing, and upon nation. This is our internal issue. The one who is, who is supporting us, uh, his support should be. These hidden divisions inside the Mujahideen had their first effects on the Mujahideen forces closest to Kabul, the Shia Muslims. They had been excluded from the interim government. Secure in their mountain fastness, the Sanglak Valley, the Shias were regarded as heretics by ultra-Orthodox Muslims like Hekmatia. Yet they had resisted the Russians as bravely as anyone. Last year they won a seven-week battle here against a superior force of Soviet paratroopers. When we got there, we found that the Shias are among the best disciplined of all the groups of Mujahideen. Each day, their training prepared them for the coming battle for Kabul. They were mostly Mongolian by origin, the descendants of Genghis Khan's men. Over the centuries, for all their toughness, they'd become an underclass inside Kabul. 
Now they were being turned into a fifth column to undermine the city. Their propaganda was distributed inside Kabul and they offered to smuggle us into the city to see the resistance there. There was something generous but also rather naive about them. Their leader, Sheikh Anwari, was prepared to bear the brunt of staging an all-out insurrection inside Kabul if the other Mujahideen groups, the orthodox Muslim ones, would begin a concerted attack from the outside. He was planning to go to Pakistan to make this offer to the newly formed interim government. We've reached a critical moment in our struggle for victory. What we want to do now is link up with all the different groups of fighters so that as soon as possible we can move on and capture Kabul without suffering enormous casualties. We set off for Kabul with a Mujahideen escort. Every major vantage point was guarded by an Afghan army post. On the pathways, there was the constant danger of mines as we made our way across the mountains of the Hindu Kush. Our guides naturally skirted round the army posts as far as possible. But the Afghan army was deeply demoralized, and the soldiers from one base we passed surrendered to us in their entirety, handing over all their weapons. They were anxious to demonstrate their newfound enthusiasm for the Mujahideen cause. Will you now fight the people who used to be your friends? Yes. You don't have any worries about fighting your friends and brothers? No, no, sir. No. You will fight and will Najibullah be yeah, defeated? Yes, we are, we are ready to fight. In a ruined town on the hills overlooking Kabul, the defectors were treated as honored recruits to the cause. The Shias, understanding the value of undermining enemy morale, got the new men to call up military headquarters and give them a piece of their mind. Under cover of darkness, we headed into Kabul. The army posts we had to pass were scared of being attacked themselves. The soldiers called out to each other and kept on firing all night long. By dawn, we'd slipped past them. We'd penetrated into Kabul. We were picked up and driven to the center of town. It was a grim place, a city under siege. Coming up to another APC here. It felt close to breaking point. Western diplomats had packed up and gone. As an act of bravado, our guides took us to the British Embassy so that the head of the resistance could walk past with me on camera. Then at a safe house, our guides shaved off the beards, which are the mark of the Mujahideen, and waited for two key undercover agents to collect us. Military jeep coming up ahead of us. They drove us round in a government vehicle, which, with consummate cheek, they'd obtained for us. This is clear evidence of the degree to which the resistance movement has penetrated the system in Kabul. We've changed vehicles now, and the one we're in is a jeep belonging to a commander of the Afghan equivalent of the KGB, Khad. And the two men with us are both officers of Khad. We were taken on a tour of some of the best guarded places in Kabul including Khad headquarters itself and the Soviet embassy. It was distinctly nerve-wracking, but we were able to film everywhere undisturbed because people assumed we were from the secret police. We saw the endless food queues that suggested the city was near collapse. And when we needed petrol, the driver simply commandeered more from the army. Afterwards, while we hid in another safe house, our two double agents told me why they'd taken on the dangerous task of infiltrating the secret police. Khad is one of the regime's most hated and feared weapons. Without it, President Najibullah couldn't stay in power. So the Mujahideen have infiltrated it to pave the way for his puppet government's downfall. The Shias knew the importance of keeping the support of the people. When they arranged an attack, they went to great lengths to avoid killing or injuring ordinary citizens. They had planned a rocket strike against Khad headquarters, for instance. They deliberately used a Russian watch as a timer. The rocket was to be planted only 50 yards from the target. Even so, it missed, exploding harmlessly on waste ground. 
We'd been in the city three days and were lucky to escape. Agents loyal to Hard were onto us, and there was a shootout before we got away through the outskirts of the city. But on our return, we found the interim government had refused the Shias' terms for joining them. There would be no uprising in Kabul. The Shias had withdrawn their offer. For Hekmatyar, they were traitors. It will be strange for us to hear that some of our such brothers have uh, understanding with Kabul regime and uh, uh, they have stopped fighting against this regime. And uh, I don't think any Muslim can commit such a mistake. In other words, they weren't even proper Muslims. Despite their steadfastness, the men they'd lost and the resistance movement they'd built up, the interim government wouldn't include them. It didn't want to have to share power with them after Kabul had fallen. So the Shia threat to Kabul evaporated. But the interim government in Peshawar, in Pakistan, didn't worry. It had mapped out its own strategy to capture Jalalabad and set up its capital there. That way it could claim international acceptance as the rightful Afghan government. The battle for Jalalabad started well. But there'd been a major switch of tactics on the advice of Pakistani military intelligence, which had established a strong influence over the Mujahideen. They tried now to fight like a conventional army. They dug themselves into fixed positions, which they'd never done against the Russians, Still, they overlooked Jalalabad and captured the vital outpost of Samarkail. That had been a Soviet base and had only recently been taken over by the Afghan army. The Afghan soldiers had abandoned it in a great hurry. The base contained equipment of a sophistication the Mujahideen had never seen before and certainly couldn't use. But in terms of weaponry, they had everything they needed, provided in vast quantities, made in China and Egypt, provided by Pakistan, paid for by Saudi Arabia and the United States. But their own actions turned against them. Some groups began executing their prisoners. Directly news of that got back to the government's conscript soldiers. It put an end to any temptation to surrender if the only reward was to be tied up and shot. As the Afghan army's resistance stiffened, the fighting became fiercer. It wasn't the kind of fighting the Mujahideen were good at. For all their courage, they lacked any proper training. Worse, they didn't have experienced leadership. They fought their way to the edge of Jalalabad airport and then couldn't decide what to do next. The government forces, equipped with Soviet weapons, struck back. In the fog of war, the hopes of capturing Jalalabad began to disappear. We've had to pull back because we don't have any anti-aircraft weapons. The planes keep bombing us and many of our men are being killed and wounded. Even if we did capture Jalalabad and the airport, they'd still be able to use air attacks to force us out. In the stress of battle, rivalries began to break out between the different groups. One of the Mujahideen we'd met had broken off his studies in the United States and returned to Afghanistan directly the battle began. He was appalled at the Mujahideen's tactics. They only know how to fight, but they do not know how to keep the place once they capture it. How do you keep a place that you can? I really don't know myself because I've never been a soldier and I've never been told how to do that. I've never had any proper training. And all of all my training uh, was for about two days. How to use a machine gun and a rocket launcher, and that's about it. On the 
the 7th of July, the government troops counterattacked, and the Mujahideen found themselves being driven back from the places they'd captured in the early days of the battle for Jalalabad. Morale fell. It wasn't the kind of war they'd been used to. Only the really determined Mujahideen stayed. This is the outskirts of the former Soviet base of Samakail. The Mujahideen are desperately fighting to hold on to this whole area. When they captured it last March, it looked as if the gamble of attacking Jalalabad was really paying off. The regime's resistance was crumbling, and for a time it seemed as though Jalalabad itself, and maybe even Kabul, might fall. If you ventured out from cover, you were vulnerable to the bombing. Scud missiles streaked overhead. The key to the battle was the Black Mountain. If the Mujahideen were driven off their positions there, they could be swept back towards the Pakistani border. Our cameras went with them to the mountaintop, where they were directing rocket fire onto the Afghan army tanks along the road. But the rockets were inaccurate. They couldn't pierce the tank's armor anyway. The tanks, though, are starting to find our range. It's a small-scale, indecisive action in a wider, indecisive war. Almost every Mujahideen group fighting here is now reporting as many casualties in the battle for Jalalabad as it suffered in ten years of fighting the Russians. It wasn't just the Mujahideen's failure. Pakistan's military intelligence and the Americans had persuaded the Mujahideen to give up the old successful tactics, undermining the enemy's will to resist rather than fighting pitched battles. It was at Jalalabad that the confidence of the Mujahideen's backers began to ebb away. Pakistan, anyway, had a new prime minister, and Benazir Bhutto had little enthusiasm for the hardline fundamentalists among the Mujahideen who had been favoured by the military regime she took over from. And she sacked the head of Pakistan's military intelligence, who had virtually directed the battle for Jalalabad. To some extent, uh, it was partially our own uh, misassessment of the intelligence situation we should have had our own reports but we chose to go on what was said to us by the Mujahideen all the voices were constantly sounded that these are optimistic the Americans for their part had to face up to the divisions within the Mujahideen the State Department sent a new man to liaise with the members of the interim government did you expect them to be quite so divided when you when you arrived here no I didn't the resistance uh, attacks were not coordinated and uh, they faltered. Uh, the resistance took heavy casualties. I think it was about then that it, it became evident that the regime was going to survive uh, longer than others anticipated and that the resistance uh, would take more time to uh, finish. By the start of the summer, with Massoud staying his hand, the Kabul government had proved it could survive against all the odds. President Najibullah was even going over to the offensive, not militarily, but in the campaign for hearts and minds. Our team went back to Kabul, this time officially. Now, in the August sunshine, the atmosphere is transformed. An army vehicle is heading along the very road we saw from the ambushers' viewpoint earlier, escorting a convoy of lorries returning to the Soviet border. There are some grim sights, an entire village which the Russians demolished just as they were leaving. But the Afghan army controls the road now, and the Soviet withdrawal has done wonders for the soldiers' morale. Some days we push through a thousand trucks of food to Kabul, usually without any problems. 
And now, of course, we're doing it without the help of the Soviets. We'll never allow Kabul to starve. It's hard to exaggerate the change that had come over Kabul itself since the time we had crept in with the sheer resistance in March. It was no longer the dismal, nervous, hungry place it had been. Food was plentiful, if expensive. The Russians might have left, but they were making sure that Kabul stayed well supplied. And not just with food. Overhead, a Soviet cargo plane drops flares to deflect any Stinger missiles. The planes fly in by the dozen every day. Courtesy of Aeroflot, they're packed with arms and ammunition. The real beneficiary of all this is taking the stage. President Najibullah is like some great actor-manager who's saved the show single-handed. It's hard to think that someone so relaxed and friendly used to be the boss of Khard, the secret police. There's a lot of blood on Najibullah's hands. Now he's playing the role of his life, a man of peace and a good Muslim. The invited audience is composed of Mujahideen who defected to him. He's confident enough now to ignore demands that he should stand down as the price of some grand political settlement. With the Russians gone, he says, he's the true patriotic Afghan. It's a hammy act, but he puts it over well. The six months since the Soviets have withdrawn have shown that war cannot solve Afghanistan's problems. War will only cause more deaths and more destruction. It would be better to start peaceful negotiations as soon as possible and solve the problem by political means. My resignation will not solve the problem. What we need are negotiations. There can be no peace without taking into account this government and the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan. Najibullah's approach has certainly won the Shias over. This is Ashura, the great Shiite display of self-inflicted suffering for the death of their first leader. We last saw the Shias as a discontented fifth column working against the regime. Now they and their religion with its emphasis on suffering and self-control have been dismissed by the Mujahideen leadership in Peshawar. But Najibullah, the former communist, rejects no one. More and more, the Shias support him. The rebels in Pakistan do not want to see the Shias strong. They want to exploit us, as they did in the past. This may not be a proper democracy, but at least we can practice our religion. On the other hand, the Shias with the rebels are being denied their rights. They're being kept at bay. As the summer went on, the interim government was reduced to rocketing Kabul in earnest. When they hit a big arms dump, it was spectacular, but it was an admission of failure. The interim government, having broken with its allies, had run out of ideas. And it wasn't trying to turn people against the regime now. The rockets rarely hurt the Kabul government. It was ordinary people they hurt. They could land at any time, anywhere. Here, the Mujahideen rocket had hit the area where the Sikhs live. It was nowhere near a military target. It smashed a family's life and its peace of mind, perhaps forever. Do them, I don't 
Ci dà tutte le chiavi per lui, Giovanna, mi do acqua. Our camera team went to the hospital where the children's mother was being cared for. It was full of people injured in Mujahideen rocket attacks. This business of, of firing rockets, which inevitably hit civilians, causes such anguish and anger. This cannot surely be a good way of winning people's hearts and minds. I certainly agree. In fact, I would add that it's like killing prisoners. It's counterproductive even in, in a war sense. I was in Vietnam in the war, and there were a lot of civilian casualties, far too many. There are also uh, far too many prisoners that were shot. But to a certain extent, this stuff happens in war. We must try to stop it, curtail it if we can't stop it. We're doing everything we can in this instance. But again, I would urge you to look at what the regime is doing with Soviet-supplied weapons and document that as well as the rockets falling into Kabul. The entire countryside of Afghanistan does indeed bear witness to the Kabul regime's rocket attacks on ordinary civilians. A Scud missile fired from Kabul wiped out this man's entire family. They'd just left a refugee camp in Pakistan to come back home. A Soviet missile kills just as surely as an American supplied one. The Russians and the Kabul regime have been destroying houses and lives like this in Afghanistan for 10 years. The missile hit us at five minutes to six in the morning. It was God's will that I was not killed. However, I lost my two sons, my two girls, my wife and my brother. They were trapped in the wreckage. I heard them screaming for a while and then they died. But no one expects any better of Najibullah's regime. The Mujahideen, by stooping to the same tactics, are damaging their own cause. By midsummer, stalled in the east, west and north, the interim government badly needed a success. It looked to its forces around Kandahar to provide one. But here, the question of attacking civilian targets had completely split the different Mujahideen groups. Ismail Gailani is an important local commander outside Kandahar. He comes from a famous family and is one of the most moderate and westernized of all Mujahideen leaders. I don't want to to kill the innocent people and destroy the city. Children, ladies or old people with their sons and daughters and, and boys, they are fighting with us against the regime. And their father and sister and mother, they are living inside in the city. When we are going to attack on the city, we're killing the innocent people. Gailani has summoned a meeting of his commanders to discuss the question of attacking Kandahar. It's not an easy one. They all know there's intense pressure from the interim government in Peshawar to do it. If they don't, they won't get supplies of weapons and money from the Pakistanis and the Americans. <laughs> Their status as a fighting force depends on the weapons they get. In the end, they compromise. They'll carry out attacks on army posts, but not the city itself. Haji Latif, the Lion of Kandahar and the oldest and most venerated of all Mujahideen commanders, hates this pressure on them to attack civilian targets. We should be allowed to fight the way we want to fight, because we're not. Many Mujahideen no longer have the heart for battle. They're sitting around, refusing to fight. Soon they'll start to surrender. Time and again, while we were filming at the Mujahideen, they heard stories of shadowy deals being done between the local Mujahideen commanders and the government forces inside the city. We investigated and found that many of the stories were indeed true. The commanders involved wouldn't talk about it on camera for fear of being assassinated by their rivals inside the Mujahideen. But they did arrange for one of our camera teams to go into Kandahar and make contact with the government forces there. 
They were given a lift in a long-distance lorry which was smuggling goods into Kandahar. Hidden in the back of the cab, they made the short trip across no man's land, separating the Mujahideen from the city. They duly gave themselves up to the authorities who knew all about their trip and began filming. To mark the Muslim festival of Eid, the notionally communist regime's loudspeakers were telling people to go to the mosques. It was Najibullah's conciliation policy with a vengeance. Then something even stranger started happening. Some Mujahideen groups were taking advantage of an amnesty for the festival of Eid. They were coming into the city armed to the teeth and checking in their weaponry at a government post. There was a receipt for each gun, so the owner could collect it on his way out. Well, for ten years we fought because the Soviets were here, but now they've left. There's no point in fighting anymore. Then the Mujahideen were free to wander around the city. There was even an official lunch for the people taking advantage of the truce, which the military governor of Kandahar had hopes of making permanent. And meanwhile, besiegers and besieged ate their lunch side by side. The Soviets who occupied our country have gone. We fought a holy war against them, but now they have withdrawn. There's no reason to fight on. It's no longer a holy war. Hikmatia came to us and told us we must attack Kandahar. I wouldn't do that. To learn what attacking the city would entail, Hekmatia should first put his family inside the city and then fire rockets and mortars into Kandahar. But someone else was doing it anyway. Even as the reconciliation took place, at Jalalabad, the regime had been able to concentrate all its forces on protecting and supplying the city. The Mujahideen should have carried out diversionary attacks, even opened a second front. But Massoud, the commander in the perfect position to swoop down on Kabul, had never done so. Massoud controlled a vast tract of northeastern Afghanistan. It was remote, inhospitable, and rugged. Our team were the first outsiders they'd seen since the Russian withdrawal. Now spring was coming to the heart of Massoud's fiefdom, the Panchir Valley, where nine epic battles had taken place against huge Soviet offensives. Massoud's army inflicted a third of all Soviet casualties in the war. They'd remained free men. At the beginning of April, they were staging their first game of Buz Kashi to celebrate final victory over the Russians. Buz Kashi is a savage kind of polo played with the headless carcass of a calf. It says everything there is to say about the Afghan character. At last, Massoud's jeep arrived. The master of one eighth of the country is no crude feudal warlord. Ahmed Shah Massoud is a thoughtful, educated man still in his thirties, but he's a Tajik, not a Pashtun like the majority of Afghans, so the interim government had frozen him out. He got little in the way of weapons from Pakistan, and the first he'd heard about Jalalabad was on the BBC. The damage caused by our lack of a unified command is obvious. There's a total lack of coordination, which means we're not launching simultaneous offensives on different fronts. As a result, the government can concentrate its resources and pick us off one by one. And that's what's happened at Jalalabad. Massoud's territory overlooks the key to Kabul's survival, the Salang Highway that leads to the Soviet Union. For 10 years, his men ambushed the Soviet supply vehicles that used it. But when the Russians left Afghanistan, he decided to allow supplies of food to pass through to Kabul unharmed. His war wasn't with civilians. But to prove that they still had ways and means to carry out attacks on the Salang Highway if they chose, his men took our camera team right down to the very roadside. From their hiding place, they sat and watched the passing traffic, unseen. A 
single well-aimed rocket would have destroyed the tank and everyone on it. The soldiers at a government post a hundred yards away had no idea they were under observation either. In the old days, Massoud's men regarded this kind of thing as their natural prey. Not anymore. It's like giving up big game hunting in favour of a photographic safari. For Massoud, the best way to take over Kabul is to keep the people on his side. We don't want ordinary people in Kabul to suffer from food shortages. We won't cut food supplies until a properly planned, coordinated offensive is launched against Kabul. On the same principle, he treats his prisoners well, unlike some of the Mujahideen forces around Jalalabad. That keeps the flow of defections coming, but his followers have orders to investigate each prisoner. The Holy Quran says that anyone who kills another Muslim should be punished. <laughs> If it is proved they have killed fellow Muslims, we will execute them. We will shoot them or hang them. The ordinary soldiers are rarely, if ever, in trouble, but their officers are a different matter. Tell the truth. You supported the infidels. You killed ordinary people and destroyed their houses. No, sir, that's not true. In fact, we've been waiting for a chance to surrender. Things aren't looking good for either of them. It's almost inevitable that they would have given orders to shoot at the Mujahideen. The Quran says if a Muslim kills a fellow Muslim, he will go to hell forever. I believe you are guilty and should be punished. But in the end, the officers are simply exchanged for prisoners held by the government. Massoud's humane approach isn't appreciated back in Peshawar in Pakistan. He's our brother, but he has committed lots of mistakes like uh, ceasefire agreement with Russia. This is the first example in the history of our job. No commander has committed such a mistake. And uh, he has made another uh, secret agreement with Kabul regime. Instead of fighting Kabul regime, he has sent his troops to the north, and now he's engaged with uh, other commanders there. And indeed, by July, the feud between Hekmatyar and Massoud had deepened. At the grim Ferkar Gorge, a group of Massoud's top men were ambushed. Thirty died. Among them were many of the commanders who'd taken the most prominent part in ten years of fighting the Russians. The few who were killed outright in the ambush were the lucky ones, according to the survivors. Some of the commanders had their eyes put out. Then their noses and ears were cut off. Then their stomachs were cut open and all their limbs broken. They were tortured for a long time. It took them many hours to die. Such a slight misunderstanding is uh, everywhere. You cannot find any country with several parties without such uh, slight uh, differences. It wasn't slight to Massoud. He ordered an operation to hunt down the murderers. But he wouldn't let our camera team go with his men to film it. There is no doubt that the men who did these things are in close touch with their leadership. My message to Hekmatir's people is that without a united front, we cannot succeed. We cannot achieve anything in Afghanistan. When his men returned, they had the murderers with them. The worst ones were in chains. They'd also captured the man who planned the massacre, Saeed Jamal, one of Hekmatyar's top commanders. Afterwards, Hekmatyar left the interim government. Massoud let the men in Peshawar try the murderers. As far as our politicians in Peshawar are concerned, I have to point out that regrettably they have thought very little about how to topple the Kabul government and instead use their energies on other matters. If they spent more time thinking about defeating the regime, our problems would not be so great. In his chilly northern kingdom, Massoud read his Quran and consolidated his power. The last best hope was gone. The boy was just in shock, but his elderly father was badly hurt.
Later, we came across some of the men who were doing the rocketing, a group led by a commander sent specially by the interim government in Peshawar to ensure the Mujahideen kept up their quota of attacks on the city. Their commander spoke with the true voice of the Islamic resistance. Already we have given more than a million uh, shaheed uh, during these 10 years of war. So what if you give 50,000 or 10,000 or uh, people more for this reason? Because we are fighting to bring an Islamic state in Afghanistan. This rocketing on the city is killing small children, women and other innocent people and all for the sake of killing a few communists. It's not achieving anything. My Mujahideen won't stand for it. They have fathers and mothers and sisters living inside the city. My Mujahideen are outside the city, but their parents are inside the city. News of what he told us spread fast. Soon after, the Lion of Kandahar was dead poisoned by rival Mujahideen. When our team left Kandahar, the temperature was in the 90s. Around that time in Washington, a State Department spokesman explained that the Mujahideen hadn't yet attacked Kandahar because the snow hadn't melted. The real reason was, of course, the Mujahideen's disunity. I've been urging them that, for God's sake, if you're fighting for a cause, you can only get it if you put aside individual differences. For instance, we were told that, well, we may be one government, but we are nine different armies, or eight different armies. So I said, well, I mean, unless you become one army, you're not going to be able to fight in a coordinated manner. And it's incumbent upon them to listen to the uh, friends and well-wishers, not just Pakistan, but others too, who have urged them uh, to broaden the base of their government and also to speak with one voice. And if they don't do these things, if they just continue as they are at the moment, what will happen then? I think that everyone knows that the way to success is to do these things. And if they want success, they'll do it. And if they don't do it, well then, one can draw one's conclusion. As Pakistan cools to the Mujahideen, the holy war has degenerated into a random series of uncoordinated attacks. The Mujahideen carry them out in order to get more weapons and then carry out more attacks. The United States genuinely believes these attacks are slowly bringing victory closer. But to an onlooker, they often seem nothing more than an aimless cycle of violence. I think that at some point there will be a political settlement. Our position is that we don't favor a military settlement, a military solution, and that it should be avoided. But the political solution, when it comes, should involve the relinqu relinquishment of power of the Najibullah regime. And it's being transferred and not shared uh, with a new regime. Is the United States prepared simply to fund the Mujahideen indefinitely? Well, I think we have a, a basic difference in our assessment. Our assessment is that the trends are in favor of the resistance. Our assistance will continue as long as it's necessary for this process to play itself out. It's playing itself out in this hospital. The casualties are arriving from the latest rocket attack. Civilians are hurt even in wars that have some purpose. This war is losing its purpose. The Americans may not approve of scenes like this, but their money makes it happen. And yet the rocket has done nothing to get rid of Najibullah. The boy's life is slipping away as we watch. Nobody even knows his name.